Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefine Horizons, and I'm doing this talk today for the Fresno State Geomatics Conference for 2021. Super uh, excited to be invited by the students to participate again this year. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to the conference. So the topic I'm going to talk about is monument preservation, which is pretty broad, so we're going to narrow that down a little bit. We're going to talk about monument preservation tips for corridor projects specifically. And a lot of what we'll talk about today is applicable to any kind of project, monument preservation for any kind of project, but I hope to share some, some tips that are specific to corridor projects. So railroads, highways, freeways, levees, pipelines, that kind of thing. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a land surveyor in Central California. It's where I live and work, licensed in California, Nevada. I also have my CFEDs. And why am I talking about monument preservation? Well, a couple different reasons. Um, we destroy a lot of monuments in California, uh, which makes my job harder, makes the job of every boundary surveyor harder. So it's something that I care passionately about. And also, uh, probably the first I don't know, 12 years of my career, I think, maybe 15, I can't remember, somewhere in there. Um, I was almost exclusively a public works surveyor, so uh, I didn't, I did very little public, or excuse me, very little private sector work. I did almost all public sector work, and a big chunk of that was corridor projects. So I haven't done that type of work for about five years, so more than that, maybe, maybe six years. I haven't done that type of work for about six years, but I did a lot of it in the beginning of my career, and so monument preservation is something I dealt with on a regular basis, and we don't do a very good job of it as a general rule in California. So I want to share some, just some tips and some advice. Um, hopefully they'll help folks that are listening to do a better job of monument preservation, whether you are a surveyor or sub, a civil engineer at a public agency that's managing projects, designing and managing projects, or if you are a land surveyor in the private sector that works for government agencies on a contract basis, either one. And uh, I'm going to try and, as we go through the talk today, I'm going to try and segregate my comments or target some of my specific comments for each of those two groups. So uh, I'll try and I'd point out when I have specific advice for one group or the other. There's some general principles that apply to both groups, but if you're a public agency, there's going to be some specific things I'll have to share with you. And if you're a private sector surveyor working for an agency, then I'll have some specific things to share with you. And at the end of the day, the goal is to save monuments, but also part of what we're going to talk about today is how do you keep yourself out of trouble <laughs> with the board, with the licensing board, and um, also potentially protect yourself from legal liability when it comes to monument preservation either as a public agency or as a contract surveyor for a public agency. So we'll, we'll talk about both of those. So here's what here's a just kind of an overview of what we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about um, what is monument preservation just briefly. Uh, I want to make sure that, that folks that are listening to the class that don't have a, a deep background in that just get a quick overview so they can understand the rest of the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about who's responsible legally responsible for monument preservation on a corridor project and uh, we're going to talk about some people that aren't responsible and some people that are because there's some misunderstandings about that that we need to clear up I think. Uh, then we're going to talk about what's the process so what does the monument process actually monument preservation process actually look like so if you're a public agency uh, you know what what needs to be in your RFP um, you know, what do you need to make sure is in the scope of services you're getting from your consultant surveyor if you're contracting out, or what do you need to make sure that your own team is doing if you're if you're doing a project in-house with your own survey and design staff, what does your process need to include? So we'll talk about that. What is the actual process? You know, uh, so the law tells you you must do monument preservation, but it doesn't do a great job of defining a process, and I don't know that, that we do that. I don't know that we've done that as a profession, so... I'm going, to, I'm going to try and define a, a process for you that I think works well. Um, then we're going to talk about, uh, after we talk about the process, uh, I just have some kind of frequently asked questions. <laughs> I don't know if they're frequently asked, but they're questions that I thought of while I was preparing the talk. And uh, so, I've got, I don't know, i got nine or ten of those. We'll go through, I'll try and answer for you guys. Okay, and uh, we'll see if we can fill up this hour. 
And then, uh, so this is a little bit of an adjustment for me because I, I like to teach in person. I, I enjoy having some back and forth with the audience. I always learn from the audience. I won't be able to do that uh, this time because of COVID-19. Uh, so we're pre-recording this, but um, I will be, when this is going at the conference, I will be available to answer questions. So hopefully I will get some questions and I encourage you guys to submit your questions when you actually are listening to the talk. I should be online and I should be able to answer those questions. If you're watching this after it's been recorded, you're always welcome to reach out to me with your questions. My email is landon.blake at redefinehorizons. Dot com and I'll, I'm more than willing. I'm all, I always enjoy hearing from other surveyors. Should I say that? Always enjoy. I regularly enjoy hearing from other surveyors, and uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions about monument preservation. So there you go. All right. So our first question, first thing we want to talk about is what is monument preservation? Give you a simple definition. I don't I don't want to get totally sidetracked, lost in the weeds. This is just a quick definition for those that don't know, so they can understand the rest of the talk. So monument preservation basically means you want to save monuments during construction of improvements. So there's some type of project. In this case, we're mostly talking about corridor projects. So you're building a highway or a freeway or a canal or a pipeline, whatever, different stuff. And you're going to go in and you're going to, you're going to build, you're going to dig stuff up. You're going to pour concrete. You're going to bulldoze. And so what happens oftentimes during construction is monuments get destroyed. And uh, if you practice in my part of California, you know that uh, many, many, many times if there's monuments in the public road right away, public right away, they, uh, they get destroyed as part of regular maintenance and construction. Uh, so they get paved over, they get chip sealed over, they get dug up, they get ground up, just, and it makes it really hard. So it's a, it's a pervasive problem that we have. So monument preservation is just a, a process to prevent that damage during a construction project and it really starts before construction so it starts in design we're going to talk about that but the civil engineer that's designing the the actual improvements that are going to be constructed the civil engineer plays a critical role in monument preservation right and so hopefully i've got some civil engineers listening to the talk today this talk is re it is for surveyors but it's really for civil engineers because they are uh, the ones that play the key role in this process and i think part of the reason we have such a problem with monument destruction is civil engineers don't understand their role and a lot of them don't even know that monument preservation is required or what it is or how to do it so hopefully we're going to teach some civil engineers how to do that today so for those of you that would like to know the requirement to preserve monuments so there's actually a legal requirement is in section 8771 of the business and professions code so that's uh, also known as the California Land Surveyors Act. It is a state law. So it's not a local requirement. It is a state requirement of state law. And anytime you're doing a project in California, you are subject to those requirements. <laughs> so if you're building stuff as, as a civil engineer and a land surveyor, uh, you need to pay attention, right? Because that's a, that's a requirement of the law. You can't get in trouble with the licensing board. So you can get in trouble with the licensing board for failing to do monument preservation. If you're an agency, you can also be sued. Uh, you can also be sued by mem landowners that are that are or surveyors that are harmed by the destruction of monuments, and I'm sure that has happened before. So this is serious stuff. I'm going to try not to get too serious, keep it light, but it is a serious thing, um, and you do need to understand it. So that's what monument preservation is. So who is responsible for monument preservation on corridor projects? That's the next question. That we want to answer so uh, let's let's talk about that for a little bit that next question then who is responsible legally for monument preservation in california okay to answer that question i'm going to start with who's not legally responsible okay i'm going to give you three people who are not legally responsible what why why would i do that uh, because there's some common misconceptions about whose job it is, so I want to clear that up. All right, so it is not the responsibility of the contractor that's building the improvements. Uh, he is not responsible to make sure monument preservation gets done. <clears throat> so public agencies, you cannot use your contract language, specifications, or bidding process to pass that responsibility on to the contractor. There is 
no way to do that. So you are not going to wiggle out of it. <laughs> um, it is not the surveyor that completed the design topo. It is also not his responsibility to do that or, or her responsibility to do that. Uh, so it's not the surveyor that does the topo for the design or the boundary for the design. And it is not the surveyor that does the construction staking for the project. So it is not the construction surveyor's responsibility to make sure that monument preservation is completed. So, who's responsible? It is the responsibility of the civil engineer at the public agency that has either designed or approved slash permitted the project. That's what the law says. Now there was a little bit of confusion about that. Um, and so we had this situation where the, the public agency would point at the contractor and the contractor would point at the public agency and it made it difficult to enforce the rules. So we went back in a few years ago, CLSA did, and uh, we changed the law and got that cleaned up and um, made it very clear that it is the civil engineer that's in responsible charge of that design work. That's who's responsible for monument preservation. So it's the civil engineer that gets into trouble with the licensing board. Now, if you're a land, licensed land surveyor involved in that project, uh, you want to do some things to make sure that you, you protect yourself. I'm not going to say that you couldn't get swept into that net, potentially get caught up into that net, either with the board or in a lawsuit. And so we'll talk about, we'll talk about what you need to do. But it's primarily the civil engineer that prepares the design plans. That's who needs to make sure that monument preservation is done. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what are some things you can do as a civil engineer to protect yourself, to demonstrate to the licensing board, or in a lawsuit to demonstrate shit to the judge that you, that you did your part, that you, that you followed the steps that were required by law. <clears throat> so, just a tip here. I'll, I'll, we'll stop occasionally and give some tips. So this is a tip for both the design surveyor and the construction surveyor you should put monument preservation as an optional task in your proposals. Right? So that should be in your scope of work. I do that all the time. Always include it. And let that public agency tell you they don't want to pay for it. Okay, so that protects you as a surveyor and, and, that, and you want to do that. You want to protect yourself. Okay? Now I told you, I don't, I don't believe the way the law is written, I don't believe it's the responsibility of the surveyor that does the design surveys or the construction surveyor, I don't think it's the responsibility of either one. Uh, that's not what the law says. The law says it's the civil engineer's job. But I can also understand how reasonably one might expect that a surveyor, a licensed surveyor that's intimately involved in a project like that should be waving the red flag about monument preservation, right? Like he should be pushing the alarm button. And so including that in your scope of services is, is one way to do that. So that's a tip for you surveyors that work on on those types of projects you work on corridor projects but um, you know you do what you can you put it in your scope you talk to your design team let them know it needs to be done ultimately the design team uh, the usually the, the, the design team the, the project owner controls the funds um, may have to decide to pay for it that's the bottom line so uh, and I'll just tell you a quick story uh, I have a company I work for uh, did a, did a design for, uh, uh, this was for a city. They were designing some street improvements, and the uh, the monuments monument preservation was not done. The monuments got destroyed, and the city got busted. And the city went back to the company that I work for and said, "Hey, how come you guys didn't didn't tell us we had to do monument preservation? Now we're in trouble." And uh, this company that I work for, this wasn't my project. It was another surveyor's project, but. The, the company I worked for, the survey went back and said, hey, we have monument preservation right here as an optional task in our scope of services. So-and-so at the city said they didn't want to pay for it. This is on you guys, right? It, we can help now, but you're going to pay for it, and it's going to be more expensive than if we would have done it before like we recommended. So that's just a good tip, a uh, good tip for, for those surveyors. So um, if you're a public agency and you're preparing an RFQ, for a design survey, uh, for a, for design that includes design surveys, going to include design surveys. So, you're building a, a highway. 
okay, and it's part of your RFQ, RFP process, you want design work done, okay, or survey works to support design by your own in-house engineers, you should include monument preservation in your scope for that RFP or R, uh, RFQ, okay, so I, now I just told you legally that the design surveyor is not responsible, and, and, and they're not, she's not, it's the civil engineer that's responsible, but the design surveyor is the person that should be doing at the actual work, the monument preservation work. So don't ask the construction surveyor to do it, right? The construction surveyor gets involved too late in the design, I mean too late in the project, after the design's complete. That's not the right time to do it. Typically, the design surveyor is going to do 75% of the work that you need to do for monument preservation anyways. If they're doing a topo and a right-of-way survey, a boundary survey to support design, that's where it belongs. It belongs with the design surveyor. It should be in their scope of services. Okay, So you can't blame the design surveyor if it's not done because the law says it's the civil engineer's responsibility, but the design surveyor is the right person to do it. So that's, that's just another tip for the design teams. So that brings us to our third point or third question. What is the actual process for monument preservation? I don't know that I've ever seen a, a process spelled out. Um, it, it's, it's probably out there. I'm sure some local agency has it in their, uh, in their RFQs or their specs somewhere, but I haven't seen it. So I've had to just develop a process through my own practice with the help of, of some of the other surveyors that I've worked with or worked for. Um, so I want to describe my process to you, how I think the process should work. And I don't take credit for this. Again, like I said, this is something I've, um, I've absorbed from, from other people. And um, I think it's a good process. I think it works well. I'm not saying that there aren't different ways to approach it, but I think this is a good, good basic process that will work well. So the monument preservation process actually has two phases. Okay, So it has a design phase. Uh, a a, a pre-construction phase, so I call that design, okay, and then a, a post-construction phase. So before construction, during design, after construction. Those are the two phases. And so similar steps in those phases, but they are different. And uh, the bulk of the work happens in the pre-construction monument preservation, okay? So that's where most of the hard work gets done. I'm not saying that post-construction monument preservation doesn't involve work. It does, but but the bulk of the work is done on the on the pre-construction monument preservation. So let's walk let's walk just walk through the process together on those two phases. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna start with pre-construction. So the very first thing you want to do is you have to identify the construction limits. Okay, and that is not something a land surveyor can do by himself. So he needs to work with the design team to understand what is being built and what the footprint is of the improvements. Okay, and it's not just the footprint of the improvements, but the actual footprint of construction. So usually the construction footprint is larger than the ultimate footprint of what's being built, right? You, you have temporary construction easements, you might have staging areas, you know, places where you're storing material piles, whatever. Okay, so you need to understand what that construction footprint is and the surveyor needs to work with the design team to do that. And depending on what you're building, you may even need some understanding of the construction process, right? So if the engineer, if the design team can't provide that, then you, then you need to include the contractor that will ultimately build the project in those uh, in those uh, in those discussions, in those conversations. <clears throat> so that's step one. Identify the construction limits. Like I'm talking about a polygon, folks. Okay, <laughs> you need to have a polygon. Like everything inside this, any monument inside this polygon needs to be preserved. Okay, and it's based on what monuments could be potentially disturbed during construction, right? And if you have any doubt, go a little bigger, right? Um, so, you know, if you're just, if you're trenching a pipe down the center line of the road, it might only be center line mons. It might not be sideline monuments, right? So you got to evaluate each project. If you're doing sidewalk work, it's almost, it's almost certainly going to include the side, the sideline monuments, right? Not just the center line monuments. So you got to evaluate based on your project. Like I said, if in doubt, go a little big on your footprint, right? You do not want to get busted with a destroyed monument when you actually tried to do monument preservation you just didn't have your construction limits right correct okay so that's step one let me flip my notes over here step two perform the land records research okay and that's something boundary surveyors do all the time you got to do it for monument preservation so you have to go through and identify two things every corner 
and every monument within the construction limits. Okay. Now, not every corner is going to have a monument, but you need to go through and identify both. Every corner, every monument. Okay. What records do you have to pull? Okay, I'm going to give you the minimum. You've got to pull all the record of survey maps, parcel maps, subdivision maps, corner records in your area. Okay, that's the minimum, right? But you also need to be aware of if there's unfiled, I shouldn't say unfiled, but yeah, unfiled. So maybe the county, the county surveyor has some unfiled maps, so maps that weren't officially filed that would show monuments. So for example, in San Joaquin County, where I do a lot of work, we have what we call our Chaz Widows maps. He was an old engineer that surveyed, surveyed a lot of the county. You want to check that. You know, in downtown Stockton, other parts of Stockton, we have chiseled crosses that mark the sidewalk corners, witness corners on the sidewalk. Those are, a lot of those don't show up on a record map, but we know what they are. Um, and so those also need to be preserved. So, uh, you know, there might be utility company records, Cal, records from Caltrans, other local agency records. Uh, you know, you do a good job of your record research, just like you would do if you were doing a boundary survey. You do not want to destroy a monument that shows up on a map somewhere, okay? <laughs> so, you got you to do some due diligence. So that's the second step. The third step is to identify all the corners and monuments. Okay, we talked about that a little bit. So every monument, what it, it doesn't matter if it's a witness corner, if it's a, if it's on the property corner, if it's a meander corner, it doesn't matter. If it if it marks a bit the location of a boundary in one way or another, uh, you need to include it in your monument preservation effort. Um, again, if you have if you have monuments that are not of record, which by the way shouldn't happen anymore, but it does. It did a lot in the past and it may rarely happen now. Um, and it's common knowledge that those monuments are in the area, uh, then then you need to, that needs to be included in your in your uh, identification. So I mentioned the chisel crosses. You know, anything I do in downtown Stockton, I walk the sidewalks to look for crosses, whether they're on a map or not. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, everything you find, you know, you find a rebar or a pipe, you have to consider that a monument and you got to go, you know, dig in people's attics for unfiled maps. But if it's common knowledge in your area that there's monuments that are not a record, you need to include those, I think, in your research. You have an obligation to do that as a land surveyor. You know, I would set up a system, especially on larger projects, it's easy to lose track of stuff. So set up a system, have a way to, to give every corner a unique ID, every monument a unique ID. You need to have a system to store and identify all the source documents that those monuments are coming from, right? And then you need to have a, a way to track uh, at each monument, what are you looking for, okay? Is it a pipe? Is it a rebar? Is it an axle? Is it a rock mound? You need to understand that. Okay, this again, this is before you've done any field work, right? You need to have this system set up. It's a great thing for a little GIS on a, on a big job. Potentially, you could do it in a spreadsheet for a small job. And then uh, just it's just another tip, kind of practical implementation tip. You know what a lot of surveyors do is they'll have a uh, they'll have a number. So like maybe you do uh, 800 series for your uh, for your search points. Okay, so every every monument that, that's in with per record that's within the construction limits gets an 800 series number. 8, 800, 801, 802, 803. And then when you go out and shoot them in the field, it's you just offset that. Okay, so it's 8,001, 8,002, 8,003, 8,004. That's a good way to, to track found mons versus monuments that are, that are there in the record versus search areas. Okay, there's different ways to do that. You can use a standard offset, but that's just a tip. Uh, but uniquely identify your corners and have that information in a table somewhere, either in a, in a spreadsheet or a GIS. Keep track of your maps and keep all your maps, corner records together. Okay, the fourth thing is you actually have to go out in the field and do a monument search. Okay. So that's like a boundary survey to some extent. Um, it's not the same. You know, you're not you're not looking at physical occupation and and worried about unwritten rights and other things like that. If you're just doing a monument preservation survey, you're primarily focused on finding the actual monument. I think you need two sweeps as a general rule. You can't do it in one trip. So what you generally have to do is you have to go through do your initial search. Okay, then you have to uh, where you can you have to calculate what I call survey grade stakeout. For the monuments that you didn't find and you have to go back with some survey grade stakeout and look for those okay so if you just you just go out with a pin finder and, and you don't have good survey grade stakeout where you can um, i don't think you're meeting the i don't think you're doing your due diligence so i do think there's some calcs involved to do this properly and where you can you need to look for monuments with stakeout especially if you're in difficult search terrain you know there's a lot of magnetic interference or you're in rugged terrain i think that's important 
and that can add that can add a significant cost to your efforts. So you have to look at that during the during the proposal phase when you're estimating the work. But I don't know how you do good monument preservation without two sweeps, right? So you do your initial sweep to find whatever you can without search coordinates, then you go back with some good search coordinates. You just gonna double check everything you didn't find to make sure it's not there, right? Okay, so you want to do that. So monument search is the that's the next uh, the next part. Um, here's just another practical tip, kind of execution tip, implementation tip. Um, record good information about all of your search areas where you don't find a monument. Surveyors should do this on every boundary survey. It's also important for monument preservation surveys. I tell surveyors a lot. A lot of times you'll see SFN in the notes or SFN on a map, but that's all you get. Well, why didn't he find it? You know, that wouldn't make you know so. Try and provide some more information. So uh, here's what I like to. I'm going to give you five things you should. Your crew should be writing down when they when they can't find a monument. Uh, the date time they look for it. The the search radius. How big of an area did they search? If they dug a hole, how deep was it? How many holes did they dig? Uh, were there obstructions? You know, was it was there a briar patch or a car parked over the search area? Was there pin finder interference? You know, were you, were you next to chain link fence or barbed wire fence? I think it's important to note. Note that I was on a job uh, last month with my partner that we had magnetic rock. <laughs> so pin finder was almost useless, uh, pretty close. So, you know, you want to note that. And if, if you think the monument's gone, note the likely reason of destruction. You know, through, if there's a block wall there, put that in your notes. You know, probably destroyed by construction of a block wall or lot, we get a lot of irrigation ditches in my area where I practice, you know. Probably got mucked out. I probably got destroyed when they were mucking out the ditch, cleaning out the ditch. So those those notes are very helpful. Okay, so for every found monument, you every monument find, you want there's other things you want to make sure you note, right? This should be in your field notes. So the character of the monument, the setting, you know, in other words, um, was it set in concrete? Was it in a mound of rocks? Was it three feet under the ground? Was it at the surface? Was it 12 inches above the surface? Was it on the top of a bluff, the bottom of a cliff? right next to the foundation of a house, you know, what's the setting? Um, it's good to note the distance from the search coordinate. So if you had a good survey grade search coordinate, you know, how far off did you find the monument from the search coordinate? It's good to put that in your notes. Um, you know, if you consistently are finding a shift, let's say you're three feet northeast consistently, you gotta go back in and look at your search coordinates, right? You might have an issue there. So, but you don't know that if you're not, if your crews aren't writing it down. Um, and then the, the method you use to tie the monument. I think that's important too. We'll, we can talk. We'll talk some more about that at the end. But did you shoot it with the total station? Did you shoot it with your RTN rover? Did you fast static tie it? How'd you locate it? Okay. So that's the fourth step: monument search. And then the last step, number five, is uh, actual document prep preparation. Document prep. Okay. So you've got a couple choices there. You can do corner records or record of survey. I find in most cases, if you're dealing with more than just a handful of monuments, uh, you're probably going to be more efficient, more cost effective with a record of survey map. You can usually include some more information on a record of survey map. I try and do a record of survey map when I can. If there's only two or three corners, you know, or four corners, a corner record might be appropriate. But um, So you need to prepare that. You need to prepare a sheet to include in the civil engineering plans. I'm going to talk about that more, talk about that some more in a couple minutes. But I think every set of design plans should have a monument preservation sheet, no exceptions. Um, and that protects the civil engineer. We'll talk about that some more, I hope. And then I also think the surveyor should provide the public agency with a certification letter. So you should certify that the agency has met the requirements of, of pre-construction monument preservation requirements per the code, per 8771. You should sign and seal it, and you should give it to the agency. If you're a civil engineer that's either responsible for the design of a public project, or if you're a civil engineer in a public practice that's approving private projects, and you're reviewing those plans as, as part of the uh, approval process, in either case, you should get a, a letter signed and sealed by a land surveyor that says the pre-construction monument preservation requirements have been met. And you should know that that, that was done. But So what that does for you, civil engineer, is that allows you to put the licensed land surveyor back on the hook, right, where he should be. Okay, So you pay him to do his job, but then hold him accountable for doing the job properly. And the way you do that is with the letter. Okay, So I think the letter should be included. I'm surprised at how many public agencies uh, don't ask for that. And when I included in my scope of services, ask me what it's for. Um, so there you go. Get a letter.
signed by a land surveyor that says you met the requirements of the law. I think that's important. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about these documents. I want to talk about what goes on the record of survey map and then what goes on the, uh, the sheet that goes in the design plans, okay? So I've got six things, count them six, that need to go on your record of survey map, in my opinion, okay? Uh, give a description of the project. What was being built? Was it a highway, a canal, a freeway, a levee? What was it? What's the purpose of your survey? You know, if, if the record of survey is only showing monument preservation, you just say that. The purpose of the survey is to fulfill the monument preservation requirements of Section 8771, either post or pre-construction or post-construction. Show the coordinates of the monuments. Okay. Now, as an alternative to that, you can show bearings and distances between the monuments or maybe time. You do station offset. There's some different things you can do there, but you know, coordinates are typically what we do. So on my maps, they're always state plane coordinates, but you could show lat longs. You could even show coordinates in an assumed coordinate system if you wanted. But put some coordinates on there for the monuments. You need to describe the character of the monument. Right? You got a member of surveyor may have to use your map to go back and find this, right? So just like you would on a boundary survey. What is it? What'd you find? Okay. You want to include the record reference for each monument. So, all right, here's the monument I found. Was it a record? Yes, here's the map. Record of survey 22-34, whatever, right? So put the record reference. Um, if it's not a record, state that. Make that clear that it's not a record. Just put on the map, not a record, okay? Um, so that would apply to, like, for our chisel crosses. If I found those downtown, they're probably not on a record map. I'd put not a record. Um, I'll also mention here briefly, I should have touched, I should have touched this on this on the research phase. You know, it's possible that, that you have subject parcel deeds, land descriptions, deed land descriptions that reference monuments that aren't shown on a map. So you want to check that in your research, right? In theory, you got to pull the deed for every parcel that's within the construction limit to see if the, if the deed calls for monuments, because there may be monuments called for in the deed that, that haven't shown up on a map yet. So that's just a, that's a side point. It's a really important thing I should have mentioned. Okay, so one thing I want to just point out about monument preservation record of surveys, they are not documenting a boundary resolution. Okay, so uh, let's just say you go to a, a corner and you find three monuments that all purport to mark the same corner. If all you're doing is monument preservation, you don't got to worry about which one's right. You, what you do have to do is tie all three of them. <laughs> okay, so uh, sometimes when I submit monument preservation surveys, uh, for review to the county surveyor, I get a little pushback. They start asking questions like I'm trying to resolve boundaries, and I have to tell them, hey, this is just a monument preservation survey, right? That's just, I'm not filing a, you know, so many surveyors are just used to getting a record of survey that reflects a boundary resolution that they start asking all those questions. Essentially, a monument preservation record of survey is a point table. Okay, that's what it is. What did I find? Where did I find it? And how did I know that I needed to look there? Like, those are the three questions that that record of survey needs to answer. Okay, pretty simple. What did I find? Where did I find it? Why did I look there to begin with? That, that's what you got to answer. Okay, so county surveyors that are listening to this talk, go easy on those monument preservation records of survey. They're, they do not reflect the full boundary resolution. They don't have to. They may, but they don't have to. All right, what about this? What's this sheet? I'm telling you to put in your design plans. All the civil engineers are like, what are they talking about? What does he mean I put some sheet in my plans? Yes, you should put a monument preservation sheet in your plans uh, along with a control sheet. So you should have two sheets in your plan from a land, plans from a land surveyor. I think, I think both of them should be signed and sealed by the land surveyor. Mm -hmm. Both the control sheet and the monument preservation sheet. We're not talking about the control sheet uh, today, so uh, we'll, we'll skip that, but... Yeah, so you should have a sheet in your plans, uh, one or more sheets that are solely dedicated to monument preservation, just like the, ele the electrical engineer gets his sheets and the structural engineer gets his sheets and the landscape architect gets his sheets. Well, the surveyor needs his sheets for monument preservation. So what should you show on those plan sheets? You should show the construction limits, the coordinates for the found monuments, the character of the found monuments, so what were they, and any standard notes that you might get from the land surveyor. Okay, So we have a standard set of monument preservation notes. 
put those in your plans, civil engineers. That's another way that you protect yourself from liability, right? If you have a signed and sealed letter from a land surveyor saying that pre-construction monument preservation was done, and you have monument preservation sheets in your plans, and you paid for monument preservation, and you told the contractor that he had to do it, and it's in your plans, I think you're pretty safe, right? I think you're in a pretty safe place. Okay, it's going to be hard to prove that, that you were negligent and didn't follow the law. So put those plans, put those sheets in your plans. How else is the contractor going to know where the monuments are? Right? How else is the construction surveyor going to know where the monuments are? Got to get that stuff in your plans. I think that's really important. And I rarely see it done. Rarely. Okay, and I would love to show you an example, but I haven't done that work for almost six years, so I, I don't have a good example to show you. But uh, if I can, I'll try and find an example, and, and we'll, try and, we'll try and share it with you. All right, so that's the pre-construction process. As I said, most of the work is in the pre-construction. So let's talk briefly about the post-construction process. Okay, so what happens post-construction? Uh, the first thing that happens, you go back in the field, and you're going to go find those same monuments that you found in the beginning, and you're going to make sure they haven't been destroyed or disturbed. That's it. Okay, so whatever you found, whatever was found in pre-construction, you got to go find in post-construction. Oftentimes, that's not the same surveyor, right? So a lot of times, the design surveyor does the pre-construction, the construction surveyor does the post-construction. That's just the way the contracts shake out if you're not doing a design build. Uh, design uh, build. Uh, so if it's a design bid, if it's a design bid build, in other words, the design process is separate from construction. Oftentimes, you'll have different surveyors doing that work. So the the second surveyor has got to go out and find those monuments that were found before construction and verify that they're still there and in the right place. If monuments have been destroyed, uh, you have to put them back. That's what the law says. Um, I think to meet the spirit of the law, uh, it's got to be the same kind of monument. So if you, uh, you can't replace an iron pipe with a 2-inch aluminum cap with a wood hub and tack, I don't think that's going to cut it. So for those of you that like to take shortcuts, don't do that. I think it's got to be a similar monument of similar character and durability. Um, one question that we run into sometimes with clients when we're, when we're negotiating scope is, all right, how do I estimate that cost? I don't know until con after construction how many monuments are going to be destroyed. So you can do that T&M, time and materials, or, or sometimes you can give the, the client, the public agency, a, a unit cost. I don't do unit cost almost like I almost never do unit cost. This is one situation in which I might be willing to provide the client a unit cost. Okay. Now it gets a little tricky because you know if you gotta hike hike through the jungle and down the ravine for a monument, that you know that's gonna be more than the monument you can just jump out of your truck and reset. But you know, depending on the circumstances of the project, you might be able to give your client a unit cost for that. Uh, but make sure it's addressed in your scope, because you don't know. It's an unknown. Okay, it's uncertain how many monuments will be destroyed. You hope none are, are going to be destroyed, but you just don't know until construction's over. Okay, so you go in, you replace the monuments, and then the last step in the post-construction process is the document prep. Same thing as the beginning. So you got to do corner records or a record of survey, and again, I think you need to do a certification letter to your agency, this time stating that the post-construction monument preservation requirements were met. So for every project, the civil engineer should have two letters in his file. He should have one letter saying the pre-construction monument preservation requirements were met, signed by a surveyor, and he should have another letter saying the post-construction monument preservation requirements were met, signed by a surveyor. Two dose, two letters. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the last step in post-construction. All right, moving on to my frequently asked questions. Let's dive into those. Okay, so here's my list. You ready? Question number one. How are construction limits determined and by whom? We talked about that a little bit. I really believe the construction limits should be determined by the design team, specifically the civil engineer that's going to be responsible for monument preservation. So his or her neck is in the noose, right? <clears throat> 
Sorry about that. They should be the ones that determine what the construction limits are. Now, they probably want to work with the land surveyor to do that, and that's okay, but ultimately the civil engineer is responsible, so they need to make the call on where the limits are. Um, here's question number two. Uh, what about monuments not a record? We talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, I think if you trip over a monument out there, you should you should shoot it. You should survey it and uh, put it on your put it on your corner record or your record of survey. Again, if it's common in your areas to have monuments not a record, if that's common knowledge, so chiseled crosses in a downtown or you know, there could be different things in different places. I think if you if you practice in that area and you know about it and you and your surveyor and you ignore it, I think you can could get into trouble. So don't do that, right? So the problem is if they're not a record, how do you know they're there? Well, you you go and you look you look at the corners, right? <laughs> you look at the corner whether it said it's marked by mon or not. And so for me, when I'm doing a job, for example, in downtown Stockton, I walk all the sidewalks, man, whether uh, there's a record map that shows a cross there or not. And I find them almost every time I find crosses that are not a record. So uh, what about found hums? That's a good question. So you guys know what I'm talking about, found hum, right? So you go to you go to look for your monument, it's supposed to be a centerline monument, and um, it's just a clean pavement, but you get a strong mag hum on your pin finder, right? So what happened? What's happened is that monument's been paved over previously. Okay, what do you do? Do you have to show that? Can you ignore it? I don't think you can. Sh I don't think you can ignore it. Um, so I think what you got to do is you got to you got to dig that bad boy up. And um, so what you really should do, surveyors, so this is a tip for the surveyor that if you're the contract surveyor working for the agency, uh, you need to make it clear in your scope that if you find homes in the center line of the road that the agency is going to excavate the monument, right? I don't think you should bear that cost. It's not your fault that the public agency didn't do monument preservation and you don't know how many you're going to find, right? If you work in my neck of the woods, you're going to find a bunch because our counties like to pave over monuments <laughs> and our cities do too. So, and uh, if you're a public agency and you're listening to this, uh, and you try and get me to sign a scope, um, you know, sign a contract where I've obligated myself and my scope to dig up all the hums, uh, you're probably not going to have me as a surveyor because um, I just don't know. Now, you, we can phase that work, and I'll go out and do an initial investigation, and then once I know how many monuments there are to excavate, I can give you a price for that, or I might consider giving you a unit cost. But you got to remember, land surveyors, there's a lot of risk involved in that now, right? Everybody's driving on with... While they talk on their cell phone, you might need traffic control. Uh, you might need uh, permits to excavate and backfill the monument. You might have to do hot patch, cold patch. That's a big deal, right? So think about how you're going to handle hums. Uh, I don't think you can ignore them, but they need to be. You know, you need to excavate that hum and find out what's really there. And I think the public agency should bear most of that cost. Right? I don't think that's they paved over the monument in the first place. So. I know there's some agencies that aren't going to like that, but that's how I feel. Uh, does it matter what method you use to locate monument, the monument? So you found the monument. Can you tie them all in, RTN? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. It matters what method you use to locate the monument. So uh, boundary surveyors, you got to use some good judgment there, right? I'm going to argue in most cases, uh, RTN, RTK is probably not appropriate. I know a lot of surveyors don't want to hear me say that, but that's what I believe. I mean, it's possible if you're doing rural surveys that uh, RTN or RTK with an on-site base would be appropriate. Uh, but anything you're doing urban, that's probably not good enough. you got to remember, if that monument gets destroyed and you have to put it back, that coordinate that you're, that you're using to, to, uh, to the coordinate that you're calculating for that monument based on your measurements, that, that's what's going to be used to put that monument back. And so if you're off a half a foot or three-tenths of a foot in an urban area, that can be a big deal. You can put buildings over a line that way. So I think if you're in an urban area, you probably need to be shooting those monuments with a total station. Um, so you got to think about that, surveyors, right? You got to evaluate uh, what what type of area you're in, what the land values are, and um, and you got to think about the method that you use. Uh, okay, here's my next question: Should you use swing ties or long distance ties? I I hear a lot of debate about this. A lot of older Surveyors like swing ties. Uh, younger surveyors like to tie everything to a cores or, or a virtual network. Um, I'm somewhere in the middle because I'm middle-aged probably. So, um, you know, swing ties can be appropriate. That's where you just, you know, you pull spreaders. But you got to be careful with swing ties because you got to make sure that your swing ties get outside of the construction area. 
you know, so since sometimes you can do that, you can go to a power pole or a fence post outside of the right of way. Um, so the advantage of swing ties is they're quick and uh, they're they're pretty easy to you can you can replace monuments fairly easy with swing ties. Um, you know the disadvantage is if you lose your your swing tie monuments, then you're screwed, right? So that's a disadvantage. Um, so the advantage of a long distance tie, either to like a primary control network or to cores, is that you, you you don't have to worry about losing your swing tie monuments. Your ties are way outside of the construction limits, right? And um, and it's it's it can be, you know it. It makes it easier. You don't have to go find a bunch of swing tie monuments to put your monuments back. You just tie into your control. So it can be easier. So both those methods have their advantages or disadvantages. I'm not a strong advocate for one or the other. I just want the surveyors to think about what method is most appropriate okay, for their project. And for each monument, it might be different for each from each monument. If you want to be a superhero, you can do both. right? You can set some local swing ties and you can tie to a course. Not that hard to do it with uh, modern equipment. So something for you to for you to think about and uh, you know maybe something the public agencies want to spell out in their uh, in their contract requirements in their in their requirements for the scope should you flag monuments before construction begins I think it's a good idea I know nobody wants to pay for it but uh, you know one of the challenges we have with monument preservation is a lot of times the design surveys are done a long time before they actually get to break ground so it could be a year, two years, three years, you know, if you get a sequel lawsuit, it could be five years. Um, and so, you know, you can have that monument preservation record survey or corner record or that sheet, even the sheet in your plans. And uh, it might still be really hard for the contractor to find those monuments and, and so as not to destroy them. And uh, some people would argue, well, he shouldn't be the one looking for them anyways. You're right. It should be the construction surveyor. So, but you just, as, a, as the civil engineer of the public agency, you, know, you have to think about, I think the smart move is to require, as part of the construction process, require that the monuments be flagged, staked and painted up before they start grubbing the site, right? Before they start uh, getting ready to, 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 do, to do construction. So that's something to think about, civil engineers, right? And a, and a smart contractor is going to want to do that anyways, because he's not going to want to pay to replace monuments that he's destroyed. Okay, that brings me to my next question. Should you charge the contractor for each destroyed monument? Absolutely, I think you should. That gives him a strong monetary incentive to not destroy stuff. Even if you can put it back, um, you know, it's hard. It just You're running a risk there, right, that the monument's not going to get back in the same place. So we just would rather not destroy him or disturb him. So, yeah, the contractor should pay a, a fee for every monument he destroys on the job. Public agencies, you should be charging for that. You're going to have to pay to have, you're going to have to pay for the monument to be put back, so you need to be able to back charge the contractor for that cost. Uh, let's see, what if the monument can't be put back? That's a good question, so let me talk about that for a minute. This is really important. So I have what I call the streamline theory of monument replacement, and uh, it's important, so I want to take a couple minutes and talk about it. So... Let's say that you can't put a monument back on the corner because the, the physical improvement doesn't allow that. Okay. So my rule of thumb is if the landowner could pull a string line between those two monuments before your project, he ought to be able to pull a string line between two monuments after your project to figure out where his property line is and, and where his corner is. Okay. So I, I, a strong believer that you need to set enough monuments for him to be able to do that, right? So then that may mean, that may mean setting some witness monuments. Okay, so if you can't set the actual corner, you go five feet up line or ten feet up line and set a monument on line, okay? And that allows, you know, your typical landowner or a contractor he hires to put that, get a, to get an idea where that monument would be without having to call a surveyor. So if, if, if that guy's got to use trigonometry or do some kind of bearing bearing or distance distance intersection calc to get his corner back in, you've harmed him you've or her. You've harmed that landowner, right? Because now they have to pay for survey. And before you came along, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to do that necessarily, right? They could go out and understand where their boundary line was with the two monuments and they didn't have to call a surveyor to do that. Now you come through with your project and you put some monument, you know, you mark that corner with some monument at some funky angle and distance, and like, 
now that guy, you know, he, he doesn't, he can't do that. He didn't have the tools. He may not have the mathematical skills. And so I think, I think you got a responsibility to leave that landowner in as good a shape as he was when you found him, if you can, if it's at all possible. Now, if that, if he couldn't, you know, if he had to use trig to find that corner anyways, <laughs> then that's a different story, right? But in a situation where you have two ends of a line, each marked by a monument, you better you better do the best you can to make sure that 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 guy can get back to those two corners without having to call a surveyor, right? You do that with online wit witness monuments most of the time. So that's just now that's not in the law, okay? That's Landon Blake's streamline theory of monument replacement, but I think it's a good good public policy, right? And um, and I think landowners have a good legal argument that that that's what you need to do as an agency. Okay, do you have to survey every found monument again during post construction? So sometimes I hear people say, oh, we found them, we surveyed them all before, can't we just walk, can't I just have my construction inspector go out there and if he sees the monument and it doesn't look like it's been bumped, we can just sign off? No. <laughs> um, really, it's, it, really, it's up to the surveyor. Now, if, if you have a surveyor at your agency that's comfortable, you know, maybe he's trained his inspectors or her construction inspectors, and they feel comfortable with that, then that's, the surveyor could make that call. I think it's a bad idea, and I'd have to really be comfortable with my, my inspector before I would let them do that. I certainly wouldn't let the contractor tell me that he didn't destroy the monument, right? So in my opinion, as a surveyor in responsible charge, you or someone you intimately trust better put eyeballs back on that monument, and... I think you need to make a second measurement. Okay, so I don't think a visual inspection is enough. I think you need to make a measurement to make sure that, you know, what if that monument's drifted two tenths? What if the, you know, the ground, what if they ran a bulldozer right next to it and it was muddy and the monument got pushed, you know, a half a foot out? And you're like, you know, you go back two months later and the ground's dried and you can't tell that it's moved, right? So I think a second measurement is required to each monument in the post-construction. Again, just my opinion. But you got to decide as a as a surveyor and responsible charge what kind of risk you want to take. All right, folks, that's it. That's my talk on monument preservation for corridor projects. Hopefully, I answered some questions and offered some useful tips. Um, and I hope I hope I get some questions when the when the talk is given at the conference, and we can answer those. And you guys will be able to see those in the recording. So I appreciate you giving me some of your time here. And I know monument preservation can be kind of a boring topic, but it is important. And uh, I strongly encourage you, if, if you work at an agency, um, you're welcome to reach out to me anytime. Uh, I will help you write your RFP or your RFQ. I will help you figure out how to include monument preservation in your projects. I won't charge you for that. I will do it for free. If you are an agency in California, I will help you um, get a good monument preservation procedure baked into your design process and construction process. Why? Why would I do that for free? Because it's really important and uh, I'm primarily a boundary surveyor and we destroy way too, mo way too many monuments in California. I want to help public agencies do this the right way. So reach out to me. We, we can set up a couple phone calls. I can meet with your folks. We can sketch out a process. I can review our, your RFP. No charge. I want to help public agencies do a good job of monument preservation in California.